Music uh, was important to Africans in that it was a central part of their lives, always. It kept them happy, sad, when people were sick. There was music used then to help ward off spirits and this type of thing. It was a central part of their lives. It was their life. Crossing to the other side. When they were brought here, everything was stripped away. Their family, wife, husband, children, even Africans of the same tongue were not allowed to be together so that they could not speak in secret so that their slave masters wouldn't be able to understand them. They had to learn English so that they could be understood by their slave masters. It was a very cruel situation. And all they were left with was a song. The slaves got here and they started to hear music of their masters. And hearing whatever, whatever Christian music they heard, they started to hum that music. And the one thing the slaves began to recognize was that through the Bible, they had been suffering, that people had overcome through the Bible. This was the language they understood most. It meant most to them because they were not taught to read and write, but they understood that here was, a man, here, was a, here was a person that was thrown, and these people were thrown in the fiery furnace, and by their faith in God, they were not singed nor burned. So they knew if they held on to God or to the higher power, their life would be saved, and that the better day was coming. So therefore, I mean, this was from their soul. And, they, and the whole entire time, they, they were never, the, the slaves never thought of, of destroying or hurting the people that were created were so brutal and cruel to them and treated them like animals. They only thought of love, of being, getting through life and getting, being free. Jesus. songs about love, about forgiveness, about hope, about happiness in the world after, yeah? It's also songs about judgment, you know. I'm going to tell you about the coming of the judgment, yeah? Watch out. You better mind. <laughs> better mind how you talk. Better mind how you sing. It meant that God was looking, yeah? But these songs came from the heart, based in uh, the religion of Christianity. And they told that story. can definitely go back and, and research and sing about the things that happened to them. But I think unless you have really gone through it, you really don't know. You really don't know. Um, I mean, there is moans, it's groans, it's feelings, it's pain, it's passion. The spiritual is, is a phenomenon that I don't think we'll ever really know where it came from, but we know it came out of pain and that it's looking for love. This soul, my children away, Lord. This soul, my children away. This soul, my children away. 
was born. I wish I never was born. I wish I never was born. I wish I never was I grew up with spirituals in uh, my church uh, in Alabama, uh, but I noticed a trend in churches, in schools, uh, a trend toward gospel music um, and music, praise music, and music that was more of a pop idiom. And the traditional, the classical spirituals were really being lost. And so I decided to form this group as a way of preserving the classical, traditional Negro spiritual. of the American Spiritual Ensemble are all opera singers and most of them, not all, but most have operatic training and, uh, and many are, are pursuing a career uh, in opera and, um, and so it gives a special sound to the group because the sound is uh, full and round and rich and, um, and it's a sound that I enjoy very much. A lot of wonderful people just love them. Some of them are former students of mine, uh, and of course I enjoy seeing them do so well when I remember from whence they've come and how they've gone on to do such great things. Uh, but most of all it's like a family. And when you get family together who are harmonious in heart and also in voice and are able to sing in such a way to bring joy not only to themselves but to others who listen, that's a wonderful experience. And when you have that, you'll understand why I say it's like a family. So every time we get together, it's a good thing.
Welcome to Music Matters 2020. I'm your host, Jason Tram. Thank you for joining our unique podcast community where we discuss the events and importance of events happening in the musical scene, uh, right, and discussed and seen through the eyes of distinguished colleagues. Today's colleague is Dr. Everett McCorvey, a wonderfully busy and active conductor, impresario, teacher, and uh, everything else, a wonderfully busy man, and I'm so delighted he could spend time with us today. Please remember to hit subscribe on YouTube and um, hit that bell for the most up-to-date information on upcoming guests and topics and like us on Facebook and please tell your friends about us. Um, we love the fact that our, our community is growing and uh, be sure to uh, chat in questions for our guests and we'll, we're happy to have you join the conversation. In my 25-year career as a music director and a conductor, a church musician, a university professor, and an artistic consultant, um, some of the most important and most um, important and, and, and encapsulating moments of my career have been the conversations with great colleagues. In those conversations, ideas germinate, um, collaborations form, and um, that's where the magic happens. So on this show, we pull back the curtain and take you in on these conversations. You get to join us. Um, no, and one, one of the, my most interesting people I've collaborated with is Dr. Everett McCorvey. So Dr. McCorvey, welcome for joining us today, and we're delighted to have you on Music Matters 2020. Well, thank you so much. I'm delighted to be here, and I'm so impressed that you have all of this technology and you can do all of these things. It's wonderful. Well, it's been a blessing. I've been doing this with my with my children. Quentin's working the board behind us, and we have my daughter upstairs. Is on the, on the she'll be feeding us the questions. So it's a family event, and I know you've got a large family yourself. I do. I have three kids, and uh, fortunate to have one home with me, and uh, two are are still out of town. And uh, but uh, this COVID has really sort of slowed everything down. So one of the blessings for me has been to spend a little more time with my son, who actually lives in Washington D.C. But uh, that's been a lot of fun. And uh, but I tell you, I'm I'm ready to get out. I'm ready to go and do do interesting things well you're one of the busiest men i know one of the busiest men in show business uh <laughs> i know you're you're jet set you do orchestral conducting you do a very high level choral conducting you're a university professor you're an impresario so many fascinating interesting projects that we're going to explore today let's go back in time tell us about the beginning of your artistic journey well, I, I grew up in Montgomery, Alabama, Alabama and um, I, was, I grew up doing the civil rights movement, actually. And uh, so the first, you know, 10, 12 years of my life, I was my parents were very involved in the civil rights movement in the 60s, late 50s, 60s. And uh, and so that informed a little bit of, you know, what I'm able to do now. Um, and I went to the University of Alabama uh, and was one of the first um, people of color in the School of Music at the University of Alabama, where I did a bachelor's and master's. Then I moved to New York and freelance for five years and then came back, got my doctorate and started, uh, started teaching. I've always known that I wanted to teach, uh, but I also enjoyed very much, of course, performing and knowing what went on behind the scenes. And so uh, when I was in New York and working for the, you know, like AGMA or Actors Equity or any of those unions that I was working for, they would always, I would always get nominated to be the uh, AGMA rep or the equity rep. And I was like, what's going on? Why, what do you see here? But, uh, but I loved it because I got to see what was going on behind the scenes. And that also helped me in terms of developing uh, and encouraging and helping young artists today uh, so that they can be prepared for, you know, what's going on in business. So that's been, been really rewarding. And uh, uh, I've just been keeping busy with uh, four different projects. Uh, I'm uh, on the voice faculty, head of the opera program at the University of Kentucky in Lexington, Kentucky. And uh, I'm the founder of the American Spiritual Ensemble, and that's a traveling group that supports and perpetuates the American Negro Spiritual. And I'm also the artistic director of the National Chorale in New York City. So it's, uh, it's a busy and glorious life. With lots of travel in between, and um, each of these ensembles is highly renowned in their field. Tell us about... Um 
Tell us about this uh, variety of different music you're engaged with at any given moment. How does that feed your soul? Well, you know, I think that when I started uh, being involved in music, I was introduced to the trumpet when I was in, going into the third grade. We used to house young men who went to the local college uh, in Montgomery, Alabama. They went to Alabama State Teachers College, as it was called then. It's one of the historically black colleges in the country. And, and one of the young men played trumpet. And one summer he was rehearsing and I heard him play the trumpet and I thought it was the most beautiful music I had ever heard in my life. And so I asked my dad, I asked him if he would help me to get a trumpet. So we went downtown to the local music store and we rented a trumpet. I guess he didn't think I was going to stick with it to buy it, you know. So we rented a trumpet and um, and I. And I came home and my dad said, well, would you like lessons? So I said, sure. So he called the local band director who was up at the local high school uh, that was a block from my house. And uh, so we arranged for a, a lesson and uh, I called it a changing experience, life changing experience for both of us because after that trumpet lesson, I knew that being in music was what I wanted to do more than anything. And after the trumpet lesson, the band teacher died. And so <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> wow. So, that must have been some lesson. It was, it was really traumatic. And, uh, and so, but my dad took me through the whole funeral and, you know, all like that. And he said, well, son, would you like for me to find you another uh, trumpet teacher? And I was like, no, dad, uh, I'm afraid I might kill him. <laughs> so... <laughs> so I actually learned how to play the trumpet on my own, but I knew from that moment in the third grade that being in music was what I was, what I wanted to do for my for my life, and so I I feel like I've been very blessed in terms of being able to pursue music and collaborate with great colleagues and um, and really uh, follow my my life's passion. And so one of the things I try to impart to my students is for them to find their passion. And if they follow their passion, they never have to work a day in their life because every day they get up, they'll be following their passion. And isn't it, isn't it amazing how in this time of isolation and quarantine, I think we're busier than ever. Wouldn't you say that? You, oh, my goodness. Isn't it amazing how yeah. the time fills in? Yes, I get up every day and I'm, I'm working on a virtual choir or a concert that we're going to do online or, you know, learning music. I had three or four scores I needed to learn this summer uh, for some upcoming concerts in Europe that have now all been rescheduled. Thankfully, they've been rescheduled. But, you know, I, my my plate is full uh, every day. So uh, it's 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 been a joy to make sure that uh, to have something going on that's a lot of fun but i tell you it's it's a lot of work i tell you the virtual choirs um we're doing uh, I'm, uh, my, my summer residency at ocean grove and which has a large choral component it has for 150 years and this year we've gone entirely virtual as uh, we can't it's not safe to be singing together in large groups uh, you, right. you, you were a guest right. on our choir festival where we had 700 singers yes. in the choir and 2,000, 3,000 okay. in the audience that's not safe yes. right now no, no, it's not, and that I, and I want to give a shout out to all of those people who might be listening. I'm sorry I won't be there with you this summer, to um, to share that amazing uh, concert. And I hope that uh, if people have never seen the Ocean Grove Festival, you need to go online and look at it because it's just amazing to make music in that big space with that large choir, that huge organ. And uh, and it's it's really quite emotional, so I'm I'm very excited about that. Well, it was wonderful to have you and your beautiful wife joining us, and we're thrilled to have. It was great to meet you there and a couple of years ago, and now we've uh, known each other for a couple of years. And watching you bring spirituals uh, and your particular energy to the Ocean Grove Great Auditorium was really something special, and that I'll never forget. And um, and I think my 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 congregation was so excited to just be a part of that with you. Well, thank you. You know, I grew up 
hearing spirituals and my father was a, a, a deacon at the church where Ralph Abernathy, Martin Luther King's assistant, was the, the minister. And uh, there were a lot of great choirs that came through Montgomery in uh, support and in solidarity uh, to the civil rights movement. And so to hear and uh, Tuskegee Institute's choir with William Dawson was 30 miles up the road. And so, you know, we would hear those choirs and the sound of those choirs singing spirituals is something that has just stayed in my head my entire life. And so when I finished college, I noticed that, and I got into the profession, what I noticed was that there were a lot of choirs, high school choirs, college choirs, beginning to sing a lot of gospel music. And I love gospel music. Uh, it's just that I didn't want it to replace the spirituals. Uh, I call spirituals the mother music. And so it, it's really where, you know, I feel that America found its voice and found its, that American sound is through uh, the music of the spirituals. And so I formed the American Spiritual Ensemble 25 years ago. I started with a few of my students and I called a few of my professional colleagues and asked them if they might be interested in, in joining in this mission. And um, very quickly, probably by the, the second tour, I realized that I couldn't use my university students because we were getting too many uh, invitations to, to sing. And so I had to go outside of the university and hire professional singers. And, uh, and so this past year, we celebrated our 25th um, tour, annual tour, and it it practically ended the day that uh, everything started shutting down. And so we started in January and our last concert was around March the 12th. And so uh, we got it in and, uh, but you know that it's been just so rewarding to be able to sing that music, to share the music, and to work with choir so that they are singing it. Uh, it's just been great. Well, you're such a humble man. I'm going to I'm going to speak up for you because I just I the American Spiritual Ensemble is one of the elite professional ensembles in the country. So, um, I'm just going to put that out there because um, <laughs> having um, having sat through um, a recent rehearsal before the tour began, um, and, and knowing yes. many of the artists through collaboration and other projects I've been on in the opera world, I just it's such, such a remarkable community that you've built. And um, the, spirit, the spirit in that room, when I sat there and watched this just magnificent on, uh, collection of artists and people together, and, and it, was, it was a family. It wasn't um, like a yeah. lot of the professional yeah. things I go to. I, it was really a family, and everyone was so yeah. excited to be there and joyful in their singing, and it really moved me yes. to tears. Oh, wow. Well, thank you. Well, one of the things that really um, struck me when I was a child was the, the voices. Uh, these were, you know, these were students, but they were, they were being classically trained. And so, uh, so for my ensemble, I wanted to use classically trained voices. And so we have uh, singers in the group who've, you know, whose resumes, you know, are like, you know, singers at the Metropolitan Opera and Chicago Lyric and all of the major opera companies. And so when you hear that collection of, of a sound that is so rich and so fulfilling, it just sort of touches you, you know, just all over your, your, your body. And so we've had singers in the group like Lawrence Brownlee, who's now the, you know, reigning lyric tenor out there, and Angela Brown, who, you know, has done Aida's all over the world, and Karen Slack, who's uh, just, you know, amazing. And, uh, Jacqueline Eccles, who just uh, made her Met debut last year. And I mean, the list goes on. And, and that's been very exciting for me to be able to work with that level of artist. And then when we make music and making music in an environment that feels like a family, uh, it's very exciting.
Well, congratulations on building such an incredible musical ensemble and to, for keeping it going and, to, and for promoting the music of the spiritual, which is the core of American repertoire. Um, I grew up in suburban New York, and um, the spirituals have always spoken to me as a singer and as a conductor, and, the, and I find the power in those. I guess it's like Dvorak said, but he was like the, the, um, the roots of, uh, of, of classical music come from the folk music of the people. That's and right. um, there's nothing more powerful and born out of pain and suffering than the spiritual. And in their simplicity is such an incredible range of emotions. Well, you know, I had a, an experience this um, New Year's Eve, actually, that um, I probably will never forget. I had the opportunity to travel to um, uh, the Czech Republic and conduct the North Prague um, Philharmonic and Northern Czech Philharmonic. And uh, we were doing the um, Dvorak Symphony. And I, you know, I talk about Dvorak all the time because Dvorak was the composer who came to this country in the uh, late 1800s, 1890, to head a, a school that was called the National School of Music. And uh, Dvorak came with the proviso that he be allowed to bring people of color, students of color, into the conservatory. And so one of the students that he brought was a student by the name of H.T. Burley. Uh, and there were many other students of color who were students of Dvorak. And from uh, these students, Dvorak learned a wealth of Negro melodies, melodies of Native Americans. And when he wrote the New World Symphony, in this country, he he wrote in the preamble of the symphony, he said that in the music of the Native Americans and the American Negroes, you have all that is needed to create an entirely new school of music. And this sent shockwaves around the world that you had a Czech composer who came to America to tell America about the music that was already here. And, uh, and so this, this past uh, New Year's Eve, I conducted the North Czech Philharmonic and, in the Dvorak New World Symphony. And I got to tell them a little bit about the story of the spirituals. And, um, and then I actually sang the uh, going home thing for the, the symphony. And I had so many of the symphony members come up to me and, to, you know, and say, we have never had that experience before in our lives. And uh, to hear a Czech symphony play Dvorak is an experience like you wouldn't believe. Isn't, isn't music and so, amazing how it can just cross borders and boundaries and, and take away divisions in so many unique ways? Think about this. The Czech composer wrote that music uh, surrounded by American melodies. And here you are, an American conductor who grew up steeped in the spiritual, singing a spiritual to the Czech orchestra before you perform in front of a, a live audience. Incredible. It was it was incredible. I will never forget that uh, never forget that experience. And uh, I know you've had experiences as well going over to conduct uh, orchestras in Europe, and you certainly know the, the 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 passion that they give for their music, be it Italians for the opera or uh, Czech uh, musicians for their music it's it's quite exciting I have a story similar to yours that i would love to share i don't think we've talked about this when we together yes. I, I conducted the premiere of uh, porgy and bess in albania at the national opera house of albania oh wow and how fun i did not that know was that was one of the it was before i conducted the, the production in newark that uh angela brown sang and greg baker and some of our yes. laquita mitchell yes. w wonderful wonderful cast yes so i went there and i used yes. their opera house chorus and orchestra and yes. I think our contract was with them was that we had to have three or four leads come from America, three or four African American leads mm -hmm. come in. Uh, Patrick Blackwell mm -hmm. was the porgy, and other other friends. Yes, he's an ASC. Yeah. Of course. Who else? Uh, Lawrence. Um, oh, uh, um, Lawrence Cummings. No, no, or, the sport in life. Um, it'll come to me. Okay. Uh, yeah. It'll come to me. Anyway, a lot of yeah. the roles were actually Albanians. 
Wow, how and, cool. And um, they just didn't under like like they didn't understand the backstory, like they didn't understand the story of American racism and the story of and they're like why do people treat other people like this so we it, it was all through translators I spoke Italian they didn't speak Italian okay so I had my friend who spoke Albanian and English and I, I to my, this day I would say something he'd repeat it I'm trying to figure did he just say what I I have no idea what he's <laughs> So in the end, it was such an incredible experience. I did eight performances. I was there for a month, and I uh, had limitless rehearsal with the orchestra and the style. Trying to teach them to swing was really a challenge. That was the, but they got it. And it was just a matter of like overcoming the uh, the, the screamer trumpet. I mean, all those great yeah. things that make the jazz opera hybrid so unique in that piece. But um, it was yeah. a similar trying to you know break down the boundaries. And in the end, they fell in love with this music, just like everyone does. Porgy and Bess is such a great oh, yeah. masterpiece of yeah. a score. Yes, yes. I mean, Porgy and Bess is probably anywhere in the world that you present Porgy and Bess, you're going to have sellouts because the people really respond to this, uh, this music. And uh, I toured Porgy and Bess um, probably for two three years uh, when I first moved to New York and I think I stopped counting at about 600 performances and uh, so I feel like I knew it like the back um, of my you hand. You know better than anyone alive. <laughs> <laughs> but I tell you every performance was electric and you know I went this year to the Mets uh, performance opening I was there opening night of Porgy and Bess this, uh, for this year's Met uh, performance and I tell you it was electric to hear this to hear that music sung by you know all these young amazing uh, opera singers and uh, it was it was just uh, I'll never forget I was it. so excited to see a lot of my friends who I've worked with recently in that production it was just it's so so exciting to see talented young people make their debuts at the Metropolitan Opera Aaron Brooks it's, for one we did a Barbara we did a butterfly together and uh, I saw yeah. such wonderful artists getting up there and it made me so happy to watch people's careers exploding and uh, well, I think we had I, I think we had about twenty eight uh, members of the American Spiritual Ensemble. It's incredible <laughs> in that uh, in that production, and I think we had eight debuts from my university here in That's Lexington. That's exciting! Wow, uh, University of Kentucky make their debuts in that production, and so I was really happy about uh, really happy about now, that. Every, you were in the you know, premiere at the Met, right, of that production. I was in the premiere at the, and that's actually where I met my oh. wife. We were both, <laughs> we were both in the chorus uh, in the premiere uh, performance in '84, and we we did it for two seasons, '84 and '85, and we were married in '86. Uh, must have been some production. And, <laughs> Well, you know, it's it's just a, a a joy to to be in New York and be in the energy, and I can't wait until we get back there. Have you been down to the city at I've been, all? I live in the suburbs, so um, I've ever since COVID hit, I had concert. I did a concert two weeks before everything went down; and everything was canceled, and I had a concert at Merkin Hall that was canceled by COVID. So that was supposed to be my next one. I was supposed to do a Beethoven concert. And um, no, I haven't been back since. Uh, I've lots of, I've, but I keep in touch with a lot of colleagues who I've been doing on this show who've been broadcasting from New yes. York. So it's been interesting to hear their experiences. And um, yeah, it's such a shame. I mean, to hear, to see the Metropolitan Opera, Carnegie Hall, Broadway, I mean, all of our cultural institutions on, on lockdown or on, on hiatus, yeah. it's, it's truly yeah. um, once in a lifetime. Because even in times like the Spanish flu, the Metropolitan Opera didn't miss a single performance. Wow. I mean, so wow. this is truly, wow. we're in something that's truly once in a lifetime. Yeah. Well, we were supposed to present the with the National Chorale, which is my other chorus uh, in New York. We were supposed to present the Beethoven Ninth, and uh, we had to cancel that. And we're hopeful that we will be able to present the Messiah Sing-In at Lincoln Center in December, and uh, which we are delighted that you have been a part of, and uh, we're hoping that that will will go on uh, this year. 
And so, you know, we'll see how, how things go. Well, the uh, the National Chorale is certainly a, a storied and important ensemble. And I was so excited when I saw that you took over that and to, to rebuild that company. And, and um, the, 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 the Messiah Singh is a, is a New York City, uh, like, treasure. Uh, people that have been doing it for, it's what, what year is it, 64th or something like that? Oh, no, this is our 5th, 53rd or 54th 53rd, year. 53rd, wow. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's been going on a long time, and, and uh, you've done you've done magnificent work with that, building that up, and uh, and thank you for inviting me. It's it's been a pleasure to be up there. It's uh, it's quite an incredible experience to to hear all these people reading the score and singing it with their hearts. And uh, last year, having the uh, the director from Notre Dame, Paris, and yes, very powerful. Yes, yes. I tell you, yeah. the um, people. If you've been in Lincoln Center, you know David Geffen Hall. You know already that the acoustics are amazing, but if you're in the audience, to hear the audience singing Messiah is like no other experience. The sound that's coming back to you from the, the, the stage, I don't know if, uh, if your, your audience has attended one of them, but basically what happens is we have 17 conductors on the stage and each conductor conducts a movement of Messiah. They get to talk about it a little bit and then they conduct the movement and the audience is the choir and the audience is serious. I mean, they come in, they have their scores and uh, they are ready to sing. And so we do a few warm ups at the beginning to make sure the voices are in good shape. And we start at the beginning and we, we uh, sing the Messiah from cover to cover. And it's just amazing and exhilarating to hear the people uh, be, you know, they're so excited about it. And uh, conductors have a great time. And, you know, and I always learn something from some of the conductors as they talk about the different works. And uh, it's a lot of fun. I've met so many wonderful uh, colleagues from that from doing those three years. And uh, it's just so exciting to be around other conductors, because as conductors, we're basically siloed into our own little worlds. So whenever conductors get together, I always find it's such a great time to learn and to, to share ideas and to talk about community. Well, I think what people learn is that uh, the, the community that the conductors live in and the community, the music the music community it's very small i mean it's you you feel like it's vast but you know people know people who know people who know people and i'm i'm sure you're the same way as i am when we hold auditions you know i may hear 100 125 singers at an audition over a few days and as i'm listening to them and reading their resume i'm looking to see who i know because if there's a singer that i like and I see Jason's name down there, that I'm going to give you a call and say, Jason, what do you know about this singer? <laughs> I tell my students, so you, oh, you always be on your best behavior because everybody knows everybody else. That's right. That's exactly right. <laughs> you get a Facebook so, message at 1230. And the, Have you worked with this person? Oh, that person was worked with me on this job or this performance and delightfully person. And, and that's how the business works is this. Um, it's a people business. You always have to be um, yeah. on your best and, uh, and act in, in, in integrity, and uh, it's important. Well, and you know, coming to rehearsals, ready to work with music learned, uh, pencil and in being hand, on time, <laughs> pencil in hand, and uh, all of these things matter. And uh, you know, and when you go in and a singer doesn't make a good a good first impression, then you know the conductor may not hire them again. So. You know, I, I'm, I'm the same way with my, my students. I'm always encouraging them to be, you know, be there ahead of time. Pencils learn, music learn, ready to work so that uh, you will be rehired. Consistently and often. <laughs> so tell me about your teaching. How is your, how is your performance career, which has taken you all over the world to the Metropolitan Opera and to many opera houses, how has that informed your teaching at the University of Kentucky? Well, one of the things that I'm just delighted about is that it's a great marriage here at UK in terms of, of my relationship with the university. And uh, the university is encouraging of me going out and doing all of these things because I'm taking the name of the university out into uh, the music world. And I'm sure this happens with you as well. 
I'm recruiting a lot of uh, young students who are interested in in learning how to sing or be in opera or conducting. I'm recruiting them to come to the University of Kentucky. And so uh, we've been able to build quite a, uh, a program at UK, quite an opera program and a vocal program. And so it's been really wonderful for me. And, and, and you probably do this as well, uh, Jason. What I try to do is I arrange my, my lessons and my teaching so that I'm here, you know, maybe Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and then Thursday night, I'm out. I'll go and I'll do the concerts on Friday, Saturday, Sunday, fly back. <laughs> and and so this is my schedule for those 15, you know, weeks in the fall and the and the spring. It makes for a very busy schedule. But what I try to do at the very beginning of the semester is give the students an outline of, you know, when I'm going to be here and when I'm out of town. And uh, if I happen to be out of town for a lesson, um, I, I typically will bring in a guest artist to work with the uh, students for, if I'm out a week or something like that. I don't know if you know uh, Joanna Mangiardo, sure. who lives in New York, but Joanna's been down uh, two or three times to work with our uh, students. And I, I try to, and I, what I have found is that when they are working with other professional artists like that, they really uh, enjoy that uh, experience. And so I will either go with some of my uh, students who are now out working in the, in, the, in the business or other professionals that I've worked with and I, I will fly them in to work with our students. So we're trying to make sure that our students get a professional experience even while they're still in in college from you know not only the quality of the productions that they uh, have at that we have at the university but also the quality of the people that they get to work with while they're in school oh, what a magnificent experience you're like the indiana jones of uh, the, the music world you teach during the week <laughs> and then you go and do these incredible things and you bring that back to your students uh. <laughs> yes, yes yes well i think that that's uh, uh that's one of the most exciting ways to find out what's going on in the business and keep your hand in the business because just like all other parts of the 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 world you know the music business changes also and we it's part it's incumbent on us to keep up with those changes and in some cases initiate those changes and the way you do that is by staying active in the business and staying active with what's going on uh, around the world and so um, I welcome that opportunity and I'm always very excited that you know I have that uh, to do and I'm certainly going to do it as as long as I can. So tell me about um, you said uh, what's going on describe to how you see things going on in America today and how does um, the music you love fit in with the social narrative of today, as someone who grew up in the the bosom of the, the the civil rights movement, around some of the great minds of that movement, tell mm -hmm. me how that makes you feel today. Well, I, you know, in a way, I'm very encouraged. I, um, uh, I I wrote a letter a few weeks ago to all of my organizations that I'm involved with, both UK Opera, National Chorale, and the American Spiritual Ensemble, and I talked a little bit about my experience growing up in um, in Alabama and how I felt like we were going through now what I would call a second civil rights movement. Um, and the difference in this movement and the, the first civil rights movement was that this movement, you have young people out there. You have young people who are saying that enough is enough. And it's not just young people of color. You know, you have young white kids out there. You have kids of many nationalities out there saying that enough is enough and I think that the, you know when I was growing up we didn't go to a, a desegregation didn't happen until I was going into the sixth seventh grade so uh, and then of course those were very very turbulent times uh, as desegregation was taking hold 
But if you can imagine a lot of the young people growing up now, they have been in a mixed environment for most of their lives. And so to see these atrocities happening to one group of people, I think the young people are saying that I can't understand that. I don't think that's right and I don't think we should do it and we have to change it. And so they have taken to the streets to say that we wanna make this change. And I, I'm the most hopeful because I think because the young people are involved that we have an excellent chance that it's going to take hold this time, that change will happen. Uh, there have been a lot of articles written uh, recently uh, after the, the protests and after the demonstrations as all of these different organizations were making statements about the, the situation. Now there are articles about, okay, are these empty words? Are, are these words, are people going to put some meat behind these words and say, you know, we have these lofty words, but what are we going to do point by point? What are we doing to change the culture of our organization? And so what I've been following is the organizations that make those lofty statements and then say, these are the things that we will do. And they have point by point by point. And then at the end, they say, and then at the end of this year or a certain date, we're going to assess to see if we've actually done what we said we were going to do. And I think that's a big change. But people now are starting to say, words are enough. We've had words. Now let's have action. Let's have actionable items that we can say we're going to do to make sure that we can pull our country out of this and move forward working together. Power, powerful words. Thank you so much, Everett. Really powerful and to hear you say these things. What is music's role as an agent of change? Well, if you think about it, um, the spirituals, for instance, were created in the cotton fields in the South. And uh, the spirituals were songs that, uh, folk, folk songs that the, sl the slave masters allowed the slaves to sing uh, because the slave masters found that when the, the, the slaves sang, they produced more work. And so they saved they sang, but what the slave master did not know is that these uh, spirituals were also coded messages, that they sent other messages. And so while the, the master was, you know, felt that these were just beautiful, you know, sorrow songs, uh, the, the enslaved were actually giving directions as to how to find the Underground Railroad and, and what they were going to be doing. Well, that music got a people through a very difficult time. Then if you go fast forward during the civil rights movement, Martin Luther King loved spirituals. And so he would use spiritual texts in his sermons and in his speeches. And so again, the spirituals were providing the energy and the strength for a people to get through the civil rights movement. And I think that that's exactly what's happening now in this, what I'm calling the second civil rights movement. The music is helping to get people through this very difficult time. And I, and I know that we're going to see over the next two or three years, some amazing compositions as a comment to what has happened and what's been happening in our society. So. I'm certainly looking forward to that. Well, I can't wait to see what what these what how you are involved in these projects as a leader in the community, the artistic community, certainly, and and uh, I can't wait to see what that turns into as I watch these projects come together. Yes, I'm looking forward to that as well. I have a question from uh, from Jack from New Jersey, a frequent uh, questioner on our show. Um, how have you kept your ensembles together um, and and in community uh, during mm -hmm. the COVID crisis? That's a very good question, and thank you, Jackie Jack, for asking. Uh, actually, I have 125 singers on the roster of the American Spiritual Ensemble. So when we audition, they don't audition to be in the group. They audition to be on the roster. And so um, 
so what I've been do when I travel, we typically travel with about 20 to 25. And so uh, tomorrow morning, actually, we're, we're premiering a new virtual choir piece, uh, an arrangement by Moses Hogan, We Shall Walk Through the Valley in Peace. And we're doing that for the Nats uh, convention that opens tomorrow. So if you check back on YouTube in about oh, two or three days, you'll see uh, We Shall Walk Through the Valley in Peace. But we're doing several virtual choir uh, performances. We're collaborating with a couple of choirs in Brazil. Uh, we have some more requests to do virtual concerts. And so what we're doing is just doing these virtual concerts. And with so many people on the roster, I can have, you know, 20, 25 work on this project you have another 25 work on another project for We Shall Walk Through the Valley. I think I had about 70 in that choir. So we're just, uh, we're keeping people busy. And the other thing that we're doing is that we're trying to make sure that we pay them because that's also very important. Yeah, artists are feeling the pinch in incredibly, incredible ways these days. I know so many of my, my orchestral colleagues and my opera colleagues have lost almost all their work. I was talking to a famous opera singer um, yesterday who has lost five years of contracts. Or, you know, uncertain and unsure, and it's, it's uh, scary times for us all. It is. And I think that, you know, the more we do that, the more that, um, there we go. I had a little alarm that went off. It's the alarm for my next event that happens we'll wrap it up. in about 15 minutes. <laughs> but, you know, uh, what we try to do is we're trying to make sure that we pay people because uh, artists have lost a lot of work. And just to even think that in the world, there are, you know, there's not, no opera going on or no symphonies, you know, and all of those people who've worked their life to try to perfect their craft, they're now out of work. And so what we try to do is to make sure that, you know, as we engage our artists to do, our professional artists, you know, to do these things, we try to make sure that we're paying them as well. well. That, that's noble and, we, and necessary and today as, we, as we're all in this boat together, we're all on this gigantic ship on the, on the storm and uh, we're going to get through this together. Yes, yes, I think I'm we are. Last, one um, last I, question I, I before I, I, I turn it over. Okay. Uh, now, you're the only person I've met who, who, who's met Martin Luther King that I've met. What was he like? What do you remember as a child about Martin Luther King? Well, well, you know, I was a I was a child, and uh, and so you know, to me, at the time, he was just one of the you know the ministers in my dad's sphere because my dad was a deacon at uh, First Baptist Church, which is where Ralph Abernathy was. Martin Luther King lived around the corner from my house uh, when while he was in Montgomery, and so uh, to me, he was just one of the you know the ministers or the deacons that my dad engaged with throughout you know his time at, at first baptist because my dad was a postman and he worked at night but uh my mother was uh, a methodist and so she went to a church at the top of the hill and uh, ame was she was an ame uh member at church with saint john so we would go from 11 to 12 to the ame church and then we go down the hill to First Baptist to my dad's church, spend the rest of the afternoon. And uh, so my Sundays were very, very busy. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, it was it was rich and it was amazing because uh, I heard some, you know, marvelous, just powerful sermons. And I would, you know, my family was engaged with people who really felt the calling to um, try to change the fate in our society. So the work, the work so of these people to lives on through your work and through your, your well, creations and your brilliance as an artist and a performer. Um, I'd like to thank you so much for joining us tonight, Everett, and um, I look forward to seeing you in person soon. It won't be as soon as we had hoped, but it will be, um, before you know it, we will be back together in the same same place, and I look forward to that very much. Well, thank you so much, and thank you for having me. This has been just quite joyful, and it's always joyful to talk with you and to share your amazing humanity that you have. And uh, so uh, I know why all the choirs love you and the orchestras, uh, because you bring such humanity to the uh, podium. 
and uh, it's um, it's it's very much appreciated. So thank you so much for having. Wish me. you the best, and we'll be and good luck on all your endeavors, and keep uh, keep music alive in people's lives, and keep inspiring so many people. Thank you, Everett McCorvey. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining us for Music Matters 2020. Um, I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did, please hit that subscribe button um, to, and hit the bell to, to, to keep in touch with all of the, uh, the wonderful guests and topics up that are upcoming. We have some, the next, the next guest will be Tuesday. Uh, that's June 30th at 6 o'clock. We have Brian Schneckenberger. It's a very long name, but a very important person who's the uh, the director of the Baltimore uh, the Baltimore County Public Schools. A very important job, and he's a leader in the music education community, and he's going to talk about how we move forward in the public schools and keep on providing music to all people. So please like us on Facebook. Share with your friends. Um, consider uh, becoming a Patreon member for our, our new and exciting podcast. And remember... Keep music alive.